I would like to um, welcome Esther Bison um, to INK. Um, and uh, she and I ran into each other at a conference called MisinfoCon in uh, Boston uh, about two months ago. And I buttonholed her and uh, I uh, gave, sing her the, the, the praises of, of annotation and um, we had a great conversation and I reached back out and asked if she might come and share some of her perspective with us and she said yes, so thank you very much for that. Um, so uh, I'm not going to go through and read her bio because it's printed on the back of your t-shirts. Uh, and, uh, and there's a better one at Wikipedia, um, if, you, if you want to go Actually, there. Actually, it's inaccurate. Inaccurate. <laughs> well, the great thing is that you can edit it. I know. <laughs> um, so, um, but uh, I thought instead of the usual bio, I would just um, ask um, a few questions before we um, get started. So, one of the most interesting things, um, I think, um, uh, about your background is that you used to be the chairperson of ICANN, uh, which stands for the uh, International Corporation of... Internet Corporation Inter for Assigned Names and Numbers. Of course. So tell us um, what ICANN does. Well, who, who knows what ICANN is? Just raise your hands. Okay, it seems like everybody does. It, it was immaculately conceived in 1998 with the midwifery of the U.S. and European governments. And its job was to take over the kind of the regulatory function that was being performed by a Latter-day Saint called John Pastel, who had been kind of you know going slightly off the reservation and using his powers. And I think he took one of the domain name servers offline or something like that. And the second immediate goal was to break the monopoly of network solutions, which had gotten the job of running this legislature a few years earlier that was just, you know, like, these kinds of domains. And it suddenly become a huge business, and they were throwing their weight around and blah, blah, blah. So, during that process of creating ICANN, which was fraught with obscurity and a lot of angst. All the foreigners thought it was a U.S. government plot to take over the internet. The business people said it's working fine, leave it alone. The techies said we don't need no stinking government regulation. So there was a lot of mistrust and everything else. But ICANN was created in theory as a bottom-up crowdsourced thing. And while that was happening, John Pastel had a heart attack and then I think had surgery and died shortly. So the, basically the, the ethos of ICANN and its board, which should have been John Pastel's, turned out to be that of a lawyer called Joe Sims, who is a really nice guy and I love him, but he had kind of the wrong instincts for the internet. Our board meetings were closed. Blah, blah, blah. Because we were immaculately conceived, we didn't really have any parents who could fund us. So we had a really limited budget, and Network Solutions had a huge budget, and kind of like a Russian, well, kind of like anybody who creates misinformation. They paid a lot of people to pretend to be the public and to create mischief. So, it was an interesting, an interesting and complicated birth. Uh, we did create competition for that, for registries and registrars, and probably the biggest question was, should there be more TLDs, top-level domains like .org, .com, and now you have .info. Net. Now there's even more. And there are big controversies over .xxx. And there were some people who thought, you know, why not free millions of them? Which in theory is fine. We're going to at some point come back to this. You know, theory is fine, but what they didn't really realize is the shortage of domain names is not of the domain names. It's a space in people's minds. 
And if you have an infinite number of domain names, you might as well just not have any, in a sense. And that may well happen because people are now searching for Google or apps, and the world keeps kind of flexing and creating a new, yeah, when something gets too large or too monopolistic, new things emerge in an old orthogonal dimension, and that's what you're seeing now. And surprise, annotation is one of them. How did you kind of get to be the chairperson? Oh, well, they were looking for someone who knew something about the internet but wasn't really that involved that they were part of any of these big partisan organizations. The board itself was like seven or eight people who were mostly picked, again, to be innocent outsiders. So I and a guy called Jim Marai were pretty much the only ones who actually used the internet. And I was the only one stupid enough to volunteer to be chairman of the board. So I, I thought I would learn something. And I certainly did, just as I learned, I'm going to learn something today. Um, so the, the other thing is that you were used to be a fact checker. Um, tell us a little bit about that. So that, that was a wonderful job. It, it, it consisted of asking questions and not being satisfied with glib answers. Uh, I loved it. I, I did read. Oh, it was for Forbes magazine back when they had fact checking. <laughs> <laughs> I, like, I like to say I'm, I'm an altar boy, not so much in the church of media, but in the religion of truth. So it was, it was great. I, you can learn a huge amount by like kind of doing the recursive fact-checking. I learned, so I didn't really know anything about balance sheets or, when I got the job, they asked me, do you know the difference between a stock and a bond? And I said, no, but I'll find out. Uh, so I reverse engineered some financial documents of Continental Illinois Realty Trust, which is, I think, a huge bankruptcy case. And my favorite little discovery from all that reading was that Two of the board members got off because they successfully proved they had been asleep at the board meeting during the time the decision was taken. <laughs> I, I love it. All right, well, you have collected some thoughts for us. Yeah. I'm going to step off the stage. Okay. I'm, I'm going to remain sitting. This is really, the goal of this is to be an annotated talk. You guys doing the annotation. And there are many models of annotation, ranging from there's a dead corpus and you comment on it to something much more interactive, which is what we're hoping to do this morning. So what I want to do is present three principles and, in a sense, one conclusion about how annotation should work in the real world as opposed to technically. I did a little advanced reading about the recent do I own my own blog? Can people comment on it freely or unfreely? And where does one set of rights begin and the other end? And the first thing you learn, whether it's from ICANN or fact checking or anything else, there are multiple truths and multiple principles, and they don't always entirely align. <laughs> The job of, on the one hand, regulation, on the other, the market or effective crowdsourcing is to resolve the interactions of those principles in a way that most people think makes sense. So the first is, I own my own content. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big believer as a journalist, a writer, an author of one book despite the many people who tell me they've read all my books. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, in a sense, it's less about the financial, more about the, the ownership, the integrity. This is my book. You can comment on it, but the, the thing itself has a, an initial identity that I can control. De facto, once I publish it, it's open to commenting, uh, legally or not, it's open, open to comment.
copying, um, excerpting, what have you. On the other hand, I believe, in theory at least, I should have the right to at least some of the economic value of that. But that's mostly by contract and, and by copyright law to some extent. And I also think an extremist is someone doesn't want people copying or commenting on their stuff. They should be able to at least protect it to some extent from not having not having it be commented on in a way that the comments are packaged with the original. You know, kind of give it give it some space for a separate identity, people invidious to the owner. So it's something like robots.txt. That's the theory. Second, I'm a big believer in freedom of speech. You know, anybody can comment on anything. It's their right. And again, that's limited by hate speech, which itself is a whole other conference of arguments, uh, sort of incitement to violence or other kinds of destructive behavior, whatever. But the notion that the government should protect freedom of speech, to me, is pretty much sacrosanct. On the other hand, and this is the third principle, there's a huge, and I think kind of the most important space, is these non-government, non-monopoly spaces where indeed it's not just the right, but almost the obligation of some entity to, to manage the content. Whether it's defining it, making it searchable, adding value to it, restricting the kinds of speech behavior that are allowed, those are, if you like, layers, they're separate fabrics, they're something else. And those will succeed or fail by the number of people who want to use them. And if I want to post a blog and have certain favorite people comment on it, but not everybody else, I should have the right to put out robots.txt or whatever and decide which either individuals or, if you like, annotation market owners. I don't know, what's the... Moderation. Yeah, no, moderation I understand, but no, it's more like the, the entity that kind of owns the fabric or the, the layer of commenting, you know, whether it's genius or some scientific community that comments on chemistry textbooks or a bunch of rabid movie fans or who knows what. Uh, Kind of like Uber has to check the uh, the behavior, the identities, whatever of its drivers, and manage disputes. eBay has a huge <coughs> number of people devoted to trying to eliminate fraud. And as a fact checker, that was one fact I could never actually get: exactly how much money and time they spend on what they call security and safety and stuff like that. But that's kind of what a moderation platform adds. That's, that's the value they add, creating a culture, defining what is appropriate, what's not, that kind of stuff. And I think precisely because there are competing ones, and there should be, they can they can be as restrictive as they want, and people are free to leave. It's very different from physical space, where if an evil government comes in, you're stuck. In cyberspace, you can more or less leave, uh, and ideally take your content with you. And so that fourth following principle is let the market work. Let it help define these different moderating entities. Uh, you know, I love, I love the idea of different kinds of filters, whether it's by who the commenters are, uh, whether or not they need to have published IDs, uh, what are the rules of engagement, what's considered okay speech, what's not, how much fact-checking is there. You know, you should be free to say anything, but I should also be free to completely disregard it if you haven't been fact-checked. 
what, what are the rules of this particular commenting platform? And then the one that intrigues me the most is people can create new content by creating paths through the comments. So suddenly the comments themselves become another piece of content. You can define a path through them. You can filter all the ones by such and such a person, or you can have typed links. These are comments that agree with the author. These are comments that disagree. These are comments, you know, who knows what. But there's a huge amount of stuff you can do. With luck, you can figure out a business model for it. Uh, you can enlist your users to do the moderation. You can hire people. Uh, maybe you're sponsored by Coca-Cola, and um, you know that's fine. You probably won't find a lot about the dangers of sugar there, but that's the rules of that particular platform. So that's what I'd love to engage with all of you about. Annotate what I just said, please. And Dan's going to come up and be the moderator of this annotation festival. So um, mostly what I'm going to do is just uh, facilitate. Uh, so uh, Nate and Andrew are going to walk around with microphones. Um, and um, if people have thoughts or questions, um, just to engage in a provocative discussion um, with Esther or with your counterparts in the audience, um, uh, we'd love to, to hear from you. So um, does anybody have a question? Or, would be or a comment. A comment. It, it seems like the, oh yeah, Jen, Jen Harris. Thank you. Yes. Um, that, those are the rules. Yeah, thanks. Uh, the, it, it, the layers of annotation that you're talking about, sort of the way you talked about them is as though they were pre-attached to the content. So I come to the content and there's the layer attached to it. But in general, it seems like it might be any number of pairs of glasses that people might pick up to look at the content, okay? So um, you were using the example of robots.txt, which I think is a great thing to build on. Um, would you want to pre-attach some layers but allow other ones to be attached? Would you want to be able to prohibit layers from being attached? Uh, you know, layers can be attached to other layers, like your second order annotations. I mean, how does, how does that ecology work in this situation in which potentially all sorts of things are competing to grab hold of content and show it to you their way? Yeah, I think, I mean, ultimately, that ends up being something that the user, sorry, the content creator can decide. And they can, rather than going through a whole lot of work, they can say, I want to post on Medium, for example, where these are the rules. So, you know, I can always create my own URL, if you like, using, that's totally my own, and then I can go to the trouble of creating all my own rules. But I think in practice, people will pick a place that they find comfortable, and then, you know, what, they can do, maybe there's a more elegant way of doing what we now call cross-posting, which is they write it in one place and they post it somewhere else where there's a different commenting ecosystem around it. But ultimately, it's, and that's why we have all these different competing systems because different people like different rules, some people like, and let's face it, it's not just the rules, it's the audiences that come in through the platform that has those rules. Yeah, it gets very meta and complicated and kind of as I said earlier, at some point people are gonna say, this is way too complicated, let's try something new to simplify it. Austin Henderson, um, I wanted to pick up on your reference to dead material and then your creation of this live material and ask if the comment is on something what is your sense of how you control what that 
that something, but it, it's changing. How does the capacity of the world to change get reflected in the comment that I'm making about it? probably can't totally control that. You can sort of say this is a place that seems to be pretty stable. Uh, but the world will evolve, which you know, kind of makes it interesting. Yeah, if you go back to the principles, you shouldn't be able to unilaterally change the rules. But at the same time, you want a grammar for changing the rules. Yeah, just like we have the Constitution, and within the Constitution, there's a process for amending the Constitution. And in, in the privacy world, you have a lot of this stuff. You, know, you own your data, except if X happens. Like, for example, if this particular database gets bought by somebody else, then do you have to give every individual person the right to remove their data, or simply to leave it there but anonymize. So there, there's got to be specs for that as well. And you can comment on those specs, of course. Good question. Yeah. Um, good morning, my name is Jeremy. And uh, you know, it sort of occurs to me that the ethos here is you know, peer review. It, it's kind of moving towards this you know, more meta conversation that integrates access from the, it's open to, to any people, maybe who filter them out if it's just not worth their time or something like that, or they're not contributing towards you know, forwarding whatever the conversation is. And um, I guess where my interest is is in you know what the potential is is that there's a platform where like you could really trust that this thing, whatever you could just drop in, and then there's there's uh, there's been it's been looked at, right? And so, uh, my curiosity is around how how to achieve this. You know, uh, in the real world, we can move around and hear we are talking about different platforms competing and so forth. But you know, what what is the potential of just merging it all, all the participation? And to me, it occurred that like, well, that that's what artificial intelligence is just going to crawl everything and then come to its own conclusions. But is there a way where actually people you know, formulating their own meaning and, you know, being exposed to each other as like, oh, this is what, where you're coming from, and then, like, creating their own synthesis. You know, it, it seems to, the, to me the potential is to, you know, how do we engage with each other so we can make our own synthesis that, that's not just, you know, done algorithmically apart from our own volition. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure this is the answer, but there's, there's sort of two things. One is the choice of the content owner where to put the content or you know what what platforms to be part of and then there's the choice of the reader or the annotator where to go to see other to see the content and the annotations and then of course the annotations become content themselves yeah the best way to do this may be just to give it all to an ai that can do all this simultaneously yeah it would which, which you said, you know, clued me into that it's really the locality of all this dialogue where, you know, and this is what happened in the domain level system where it's, you know, this conversation's over here and this other one's over here and then, you know, if, what if they're talking to each other in some sense? And, yes. and the potential of hypertext is where that's actually what's happening. Right, and everything's linked. Yeah. 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 We, yeah, we all agree. Now the question is how to make it interesting and effective and how do people not get lost? And that's where you have all the value added, that simply because we are too small and too limited in time to, I use the word comprehend, not just as understand, but kind of to absorb everything. Yeah. We try to increase our utility by letting other people do some of the filtering for us or create, yeah. I want to listen to these people, and I don't really want to listen to anyone who's talking in Bulgarian because I can't understand it. Yeah. And yeah. I want scientists, not uh, cultists. And yeah. And okay. I have a point of view. I. Uh, Wanted to make sure I understood your group of uh, robots.tech kind of analysis. Um, 
challenge you. Are you suggesting that the author of a page has some sort of directive in that page that to suggest whether or not a reader should be using uh, annotation tool? Yes. In the sense that I don't want it attached to my page. You can, you can talk about it elsewhere, but I don't want someone who visits my content to sort of see an outward link to your harassment, uh, you know, nasty comments, uh, whatever. Yeah, so, uh, because in the real world, you know, when the internet was created, everybody was really nice who was on it. Yeah. <laughs> and now that's changed. So let me, you know, the, 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 the dissenting view there would be that uh, when the page lands, you know, on it, your screen and your laptop, then you, you know, as the, you know, person who's running the browser ought to be able to do whatever you wish with how it's displayed, people strip ads and reformats text on pages all the time. That you know, maybe the people who wrote those pages would rather not do. So um, I don't know what do you. Uh... Well, as somebody, I mean, coming from that world of advertising and stuff as well, yeah, I don't want people to take my content and use it to sell ads by putting it inside a frame and making a whole bunch of money off my content. I mean, there are, or yeah, I misunderstood. Uh, that you package ads on your content, but when it comes into your browser, you deploy JavaScript to strip it out, ah. um, de de denying the uh, logger of the revenue. We deploy lots of these little technologies yeah. in the browsers because browsers are so wonderful and let us do them. And you know, should we have a directive that annotation providers <laughs> pay attention to and, and honor? to prohibit um, activity that the user in the browser is deciding to do in terms of participating in the larger community. Um, it's an interesting um, tension. To me, the ideal norm is anonymity should be discouraged, but allowed. And in, at the same time, anybody can set up their filter, at least in theory, to ignore anyone who's anonymous. Like, if you don't want to put your name there, I don't want to listen to you. And then it becomes the job of reporters to trawl anonymous comments to find the truth being revealed, whistleblowers, uh, you know, maybe WikiLeaks, whatever. But in the same way, I think you want to sort of say annotation should be permitted, but in the end, ideally, the control is left to the individual. The individual should, kind of like not being anonymous, the in individual should be willing to be commented on, but there may be extreme cases in which they should have the protection of being left alone, at least by some people. And, and talking about that and, and setting it as a norm, because the last thing you want to do is end up with a whole bunch of laws that end up being too complicated to understand and always resolved in a way you don't want them resolved. Hi, I'm Tom Gillespie. Uh, maybe I'm missing some of the history here, but to me it has always seemed that if I publish a publicly available URL, game over, right? It's out there. Um, I can't publish and then say, oh, you're not allowed to comment on this. Um, I, that seems sort of fundamentally against everything that the web stands for? Yes, you can comment on it, but you can't. You shouldn't be able to, in an, you shouldn't be able to attach yourself to the content. You should be able to point to the content, but do it from outside. Um, yeah, I mean, you might not like that. And,
there are people who, who feel the difference very strongly when they feel they can't publish without being kind of defaced. I think part of part of um, what we, you know, there are tweets. Tweets can include a URL, and so therefore you could build a plugin. Just if we imagine kind of a hypothetical example, I could build a plugin that um, when I went to a page, went to the Twitter's API with that URL and pulled the tweets to mention that and, and showed them the sidebar on top of the page, and therefore did essentially what annotation does. Um, and the thing that's different about annotation and that, that has created this whole thing that what I think you know, me as somebody involved in an annotation project should respect is that there is a, a palpable somehow difference in it um, that is you know gets people some some people and thankfully not everybody but some people who are at risk um, uh, and, and some others um, gives makes their skin kind of crawl a little bit and, and kind of feels like um, makes it feel like somebody's stepping on their turf. Um, and I think our, you know, just speaking from hypothesis, our goal is to try to navigate this in a way that, that protects the freedom of speech, um, the ability to annotate governments and you know, media empires and things like that, and, but also tries to find a way to, to protect uh, um, voices at risk. So it's, it's an extremely challenging problem. We don't have all the answers, which is one of the reasons why um, I'm so grateful that you know, you're up here helping us talk about it. Without any answers, either. Uh, um, any a few yeah, remaining questions? Um, yeah, so there's this edge condition, and you sort of mentioned it. The edge condition, I think, is, for me, the story of who I am. So let's take it as an example um, a LinkedIn profile. Do I have the absolute right to say I have a PhD from Stanford, even if I don't? And should people have a right to fact check that? Now, I think we're in agreement that somewhere else, somebody could call me out. But should I have, should everyone have a right to call me out on my LinkedIn profile? Should people have a right to give me a negative reference? And I guess also in terms of your principles, should I have a right to allow that? Because I'll tell you one thing that's happened to me as I've gone from being you know, an employee and a manager inside a, an environment with salespeople and clients, I had a lot of feedback that said, look, you know, you've gone a little off the rails here, or you're doing this, but you, know, you need to manage yourself. Whereas now, as a more independent agent, I kind of do need a way for people to say, you, know, you need to chill here, or you know, <clears throat> don't ask that question in this meeting. <laughs> So what's your feeling about that? The story of me, should there be a place where I get to say who I am, whether it's true or not? Yes, there should. Um, but it may be a place that very few people go. <laughs> and I mean, at the same time, on LinkedIn, you live by the rules of LinkedIn because you put your profile up on LinkedIn and they, they control the rules of the game. I, you know, it's, it's an interesting question. I haven't spent a lot of time exploring exactly what they do and what they do about mean comments. Um, you know, I think LinkedIn is a kind of aspirational place. And if I started making mean comments about people, they'd probably make mean comments back and then I wouldn't get a job. So you have a slightly artificial atmosphere. But, you know, again, it's, it's your right to tell your story. It's other people's rights to comment on it, but perhaps not on your own particular little plot of content. Yeah. But then I don't need to hire you. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Like 
if you what are your predictions regarding that and if that's not successful, what do you see um, what do you see people like the process doing like sticking with extensions or such like that or separate applications? And that's really a question for Dan, but in a sense that's what this is all about. You know, medium is out there, but when you start putting it in the browser, that's where you want the ability for the I guess I would say, you know, many talks and uh, many people will get up here and, and have those kind of discussions today. Rob Sanders is going to talk about the W3C standards process. And the goal of which was to get this to be something that would becomes web native and, and ultimately, I think, um, has, finds a way into the browser. But if we as a community don't work through some of these really challenging issues, then, um, then that's less likely to happen. Um, because it's one thing for me as a, a user to make the choice electively amongst some other consensual adults to add an extension to the browser because then I really am choosing the community. But at the point that it becomes built in, I still may have to choose my provider, my annotation provider at that point. But it starts to become closer to the content and more of a permanent thing over the content and less of an elective um, um, that, that folks are making. So, uh, um, you know, I certainly think that um, the benefits of annotation and the cool things that are possible, and the wonderful opportunities that are open, which are why we're all here, um, are things that we should pursue and it would be great if they become more widespread in browsers, but we've got a lot of hard work to do. And, and that goes back to the thing where once you make it a browser standard, it becomes a monopoly and therefore needs that constraint because the user has very little, the, the content owner has very little choice at that point because people are using the standard everywhere. So this is actually related to the tension that people have been asking about between the rights of creators versus the rights of readers or watchers or whatever. Like, you know, there's a boundary, that fuzzy boundary between modifying a work itself versus mentioning a work separately. Right? And that's parallel in the fuzzy boundary between the content of the web and the browser chrome surrounding it. So regarding where in your personal opinion, where do you think one ends and the other begins? Like like do you do you like for instance if a browser if a browser superimposes UI, like browsers change all the time, they change their UIs all the time. And people don't consider that part of their work. Do you think the problem is like people may be worried that comments or annotations be are being misrepresented as part of the original work, or do you think the problem is that a lot of people are seeing stuff comp like compulsively, like stuff that they don't that they don't want to agree with? Well, where do you think where do you think one begins at the other end as far as browser UI versus content and you know and content control versus uh, media control? Well, there's a project that, that the people in the annotation um, community uh, cite frequently as the kind of the prior art for this argument, which was a, a project called Third Voice. It was a company, and it was, um, I think, somebody else probably knows better than me, but about 1998, 1999, somewhere in there. Um, and it was, you know, there's a long history of these projects going all the way back to Mark Andreessen's. Um, Mosaic.93 uh, that had, uh, 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 for two months, had annotation built in. Um, and, but Third Voice you know, created a plugin of some sort to get the browser. And um, people went crazy uh, um, in, a, in a bad way. But basically, they felt like this was graffiti on top of their website. And this was you know, the, the kind of origin story for this particular argument and this particular objection that people are having. And, um, if I recall, there was a, group, a large group of these website owner and blogger folks that got together and threatened to file uh, a lawsuit against um, the, the company. Um, I'm sure you read up on Wikipedia, I may not have it exactly right. Um, but I think the company folded for other reasons, but, but this was, um, you know, this is, I think that is exactly the, the problem that people have is that they perceive it to be scribbling on, on their, their website. And your question as to where do you draw that line, 
I think it should be up to the content creator to draw the line for themselves. And that, that's what this is about. So, so what about government units? Well, who, who defines where we, as a, as a community, get to override that? Um, well, again, fundamentally I would say hate speech, incitement to violence, and, and you know, obscenity as opposed to pornography. There's, there's a few of those that are pretty well recognized, but beyond that, you know, again, I want it to be up to the content creator, and then whoever wants to create a platform with whatever rules they like. So, it, and it, you know, if a government, should, should citizens be able to annotate, let's say the Turkish oh, government, the yes. Russian government, puts the annotate.txt flag up and says, sorry, don't annotate. Yeah, well, then there's my opinions about what governments should do, and I mean, it goes back to, if I want to be private and anonymous and do nothing, that should be okay. But if I want to go out and have coercive power, have monopoly power over what people see, or if you know, I can call the police and arrest you, then I should be extremely constrained in what I can do, or, or in what we as, yeah, speaking now as a government, but of course, not all governments pay attention to my opinions. So, I think. I think this actually gets to the heart of what, where you just ended up, which is the heart of my question, which is we keep talking about sort of the power to do this, the power to do that, and maybe the governments won't listen to us, maybe, maybe the browser vendors won't listen to us. I feel like we're, like, where does power fit into this? Like, I think that, that is the real question. and like. The default layer is that a content creator uses is going to be determined by the power they have over over the ecosystem and their reach, because if you don't you don't want to publish somewhere where no one's going to see it, um, and you don't want to publish something if the government's going to stop you, um, and so uh, and I think even these additional lenses like if even if hypothesis was just a browser extension that was just had really broad reach it could never use it and therefore they ever, they ever, you know, it, for example you could imagine. Facebook or Google just in every link showing annotations in the searches, not in the browser. That would also be an annotation that would have great reach, great power. But they have the power to choose whether or not you can do that or not. Um, so I think, I guess I'm wondering uh, where does power really fit into this and what happens like when you have also have maybe have other powerful platforms like Snapchat where there really isn't an, a good an opportunity for annotation layer unless they explicitly decide. And yeah. I think Snapchat should be able to do that, and, and people can choose whether they like it or not. Well, well there you're not, oh, sorry. Oh. I mean, so to your ultimate question, where does the power come from? One place it comes from is, like, let's face it, it's, it's grandfathered in. The USG has physical power over us here, which it mostly doesn't abuse too badly. Um, the Turkish government has a lot more power than, the alternative power is a group like this getting much larger and creating a standard that people who create browsers and various kinds of tools observe. Uh, it's, you know, that's where it comes from. And the discussion here is thinking about how to use that power wisely, number one, and perhaps how to how to make that power, how to increase that power by reaching other people, most of whom are completely not interested in this whole topic, and getting them to support this. Hi, I'm Gail Clement. I'm a librarian at Caltech. And I just wanted to offer a small perspective from you know, a profession that looks at this in a more generalized way. And I mean, we look at author rights, um, in a more holistic way than the idea of freedom of speech, so this is what we're going to read all day. But for me, I, I see this moral rights discussion as very generalizable. We live in a country that's made a very concrete choice to limit to the tiniest degree possible the moral rights of our creators in this country. When we joined uh, the Berne Convention, we made a very calculated choice in our society 
that the rights we give authors is economic, not moral. And we skip to the edge of what we could do as a country to just get in the door with the rest of the world to have a part of an international copyright convention. But Europe and everybody else really respects personhood and gives authors and artists a lot more moral rights. So I think we have to start by understanding that this conversation around author rights and moral rights isn't just about invitation, it's a very generalizable principle. And if we can maybe borrow from some of the wisdom and perception of perspectives from the larger sort of information ethics community in this discussion, maybe we can move it forward and see what the answers are. The other thing is that there's an awful lot of exploitation that we live with every day uh, from a social justice perspective around respecting other people's rights when it comes to traditional knowledge. So it's not just web authors. I would argue that people that wrote the Talmud or ancient texts, peoples that have had their wisdom traditions be subject to all different kinds of crazy stuff. You know, there's a huge social justice uh, component to this discussion that I have to, again, come from a generalist or an informationist perspective. This is the cost of openness. <coughs> and when traditional communities try and shut down access or use or misappropriation uh, of their knowledge traditions, they don't find any help because it's kind of hard to endure. It's not actual. I just wanted to offer a more generalizable sense that I don't think this discussion is orphaned in the end. It's very important and relevant, but maybe we can draw on wisdom and uh, explorations that have already taken place around this dilemma of protecting moral rights in a country that's very capitalist and really only protects economic rights when it comes to capitalism. Seems like a good place to end this discussion, but to start another one. I'd just like to say thank you for joining us.